we're so happy that you can join us today. My name is Jacqueline Mertz. I am the Museum Programs Coordinator here at the National Museum of the Pacific War. And we have a great webinar planned for you all. Here with me, I have Chris McDougall, our uh, Director of Library and Archives. And today he's going to do a short video about the artifacts that we have that are all based on Midway. So we hope you enjoyed this video. And afterwards, we're gonna have our guest speaker also Craig Simons join us to tell us a little bit more about that battle. And then we're gonna open it up to, the, uh, to you audience for some questions. So I hope you guys have a blast. Aviation played a crucial role during the Battle of Midway. And most of the items that I'm sharing with you today are related to the airmen and aircraft who were there. Let's take a closer look inside this exhibit case. Here is the flight jacket that was worn during the battle by Lieutenant Earl Gallagher, who commanded the 1st Division of Scouting Squadron 6 on the aircraft carrier USS Enterprise. His squadron flew four separate missions against Japanese naval forces. During one of the missions, Gallagher reported scoring a direct hit on the aircraft carrier Akagi. Later, he was awarded a Navy Cross for his actions that day. The next item is this leather flight helmet that was worn by Lieutenant Richard Best, who commanded Bombing Squadron 6, which also flew four missions during the battle. Best flew on two of them and scored a definite hit on Carrier Akagi and a probable hit on Carrier Hiryu later that same day. Lieutenant Best was awarded the Navy Cross and its Distinguished Flying Cross for helping sink both ships. As Best pointed out when he donated the helmet, that even though the Battle of Midway was fought in a tropical setting, American dive bombers usually flew in temperatures below freezing at 20,000 feet. This was done to avoid detection by enemy ships and hold an advantage over lower flying Japanese Zeros. It's also worth noting that on this particular day, faulty oxygen equipment caused Best and the other pilots in his squadron to lower their altitude to 15,000 feet. The goggles and knife seen here were worn by Ensign Gay during the Battle of Midway. He was a pilot assigned to Torpedo Squadron 8 on USS Hornet. Gay was born in Waco, Texas, and among the other members of his squadron, he was known as Tex. During the battle, only 10% of torpedo bombers survived. All of the aircraft in Ensign Gay's squadron were shot down as they attempted to sink the carrier Soryu. Tex was the only airman among Torpedo Squadron 8's 15 crews to survive. He managed to stay afloat and avoid capture while witnessing the destruction and sinking of carriers Akagi, Kaga, and Soryu. During his medical recovery, Gay received the Navy Cross for heroism at the Battle of Midway. After his death in 1994, as requested, George Gay's ashes were spread at the approximate site in the ocean where his comrades lost their lives. All of the items that you have seen up to this point can be seen in the Battle of Midway exhibit area in our museum. We are only able to display three to 4% of our collection at any given time. So what I would like to talk about now are some of the items that are in our collection that have not been put on exhibit yet. This watch was worn by Lieutenant Konami Harada during the Battle of Midway. Harada, seen in this photo, was a Zero pilot assigned to Japanese aircraft carrier Soryu. Depending on the source, Harada has been credited with shooting down either three or five attacking American aircraft that day. When his Zero ran out of ammunition and was low on fuel, Harada landed on the carrier Hiryu because it was the only one that survived the initial waves of American attackers. Harada was then able to get his aircraft refueled, rearmed, and airborne to defend the remaining ships of the Japanese fleet. Here you was later sunk, and as a result, Harada was forced to ditch his aircraft in the ocean. He was adrift for four hours until the destroyer Makigumo rescued him. Time on the watch is stopped at the moment Harada Zero impacted the ocean. This other photograph of Harada was taken during his appearance as a panelist at the 2007 National Museum of the Pacific War Symposium 
titled Turning Points, Midway and Guadalcanal. With him are other panelists from that event. The artifacts that follow are linked to Midway Atoll during the battle. Before showing and talking about them, it might be good to know a little about what the atoll was like in 1942. Viewed from the air, the shape of Midway Atoll looks similar to an incomplete irregular circle. Two islands and a large sand spit occupy the southern part of that circle and the remainder is coral. Sand Island is to the west and to the east is Eastern Island. The large sand spit is known as Spit Island. The U.S. Navy had oversight of this atoll throughout the war and Sand Island contained most of the infrastructure required to conduct military operations from it. Naval Air Station Midway occupied most of Eastern Island and multiple anti-aircraft batteries were sprinkled throughout the perimeters of both islands to defend them from air attack. Finally, any description of Midway Atoll would be incomplete without mentioning the large population of albatross that are on the islands. At that time, they were usually referred to as Goonie Birds by service members. Here is a photo of comedian Joe E. Brown with one of the albatross when he visited the atoll a year after the Battle of Midway. This next photo shows Admiral Nimitz emerging from a bunker, probably on Sand Island. The handwriting at the bottom is the Admiral's, and as you can see, he wrote Inspection of Midway, early May 1942 before the action. At the time of that inspection, there had been no confirmation that Midway would be attacked, but the codebreakers at SyncPak headquarters thought that it was a likely target. On a hunch, Admiral Nimitz made this trip to the atoll so he could examine the defenses firsthand and was confident about them after he left. The first phase of the Japanese plan of attack at Midway called for a pre-invasion assault from the air on sand and eastern islands. 108 Japanese aircraft sent from all four aircraft carriers pummeled the two islands on the morning of June 4. The fragments that you see here were donated to the museum in 2017. They are from one of the Japanese Zeros that was shot down by defending Marines. They were collected after the battle by PFC Lawrence McDougall, who is no relation to me. Private McDougall served with the 22nd Provisional Marine Company at Midway Atoll and helped man a 40mm anti-aircraft gun during the battle. These notes are also related to PFC McDougall's experiences at Midway Atoll. The writing on this page consists of single words in both Japanese and English that he used while trying to communicate with survivors from the aircraft carrier Hiryu, who had been adrift in a lifeboat for two weeks after the battle. They were rescued by the American Navy and brought to the medical clinic on Sand Island to recover before they were sent to a prisoner of war camp. McDougall was assigned to help guard the POWs during their recovery. The final items that I'm going to show you are related to a unique part of the Battle of Midway that is often overlooked. At one point in the most recent version of the Midway movie, there is a brief segment that shows a small group of B-26 bombers attacking a Japanese aircraft carrier. What was shown is an element of the overall battle that could be the subject of a movie in itself. Before war with Japan was declared, the B-26 bomber was relatively new and some growing pains were experienced while figuring out how well the aircraft performed and how it could be utilized. Soon after the declaration of war, modification of the B-26 design was introduced that made it possible to carry and release a single torpedo from underneath its bomb bay. The plan was to eventually send B-26s with this modification to the South Pacific. In mid-May 1942, four unmodified B-26s and their crews were sent to Hickam Field so that they could be prepared for deployment to Midway Atoll. Two of the aircraft and crews came from the 69th Bombardment Squadron, 38th Bombardment Group, and two came from the 18th Reconnaissance Squadron, 22nd Bombardment Group. Towards the end of May, each of the chosen aircraft were modified to carry torpedoes, and the officers assigned to them were taught how to torpedo bomb by Navy personnel. The aircraft and crews arrived at Naval Air Station Midway less than a week before the battle, and proceeded to wait. Elements of the Japanese landing force that was tasked with capturing the atoll were spotted on June 3, and during the early morning of June 4, 
the main fleet was located. At that point, Midway was also alerted that a large number of enemy aircraft were headed their way. The order was then given to send out the B-26s. Once they were all airborne, the small group flew in a diamond formation with Captain James J. Collins of the 38th Bombardment Group in front and Lieutenant James P. Meary of the 22nd Bombardment Group following. 30 minutes after leaving Eastern Island, the B-26s encountered heavy anti-aircraft fire from ships escorting the carriers Akagi, Kaga, Soryu, and Hiryu and were fiercely attacked by defending fighters. Soon, the aircraft of Collins and that of Miri were the only ones left to carry out the mission. Collins' aircraft managed to release its torpedo 800 yards from carrier Akagi at 200 feet above the waves. The hydraulic system of his aircraft was destroyed, but he was able to speed up into the clouds and get away from the chaos below. Lieutenant James Miri's aircraft also launched its torpedo and its and his crew must have experienced both a thrill and sheer terror as they swooped around afterward and buzzed the flight deck of Akagi before zooming upward into, into a cloud bank to escape. During the melee, his B-26 was riddled with bullet holes and three members of the crew were wounded. Afterward, both Captain Collins and Lieutenant Meary found their way back to Eastern Island but each was forced to make an emergency landing and both aircraft were deemed total losses. The final two items that I am sharing with you today were donated to the museum last year by the son of one of the crewmen from Captain Collins aircraft. This diary was kept by Sergeant Jack Dunn, who was the engineer top turret gunner and inside of it he made notes about the time period leading up to and the day of the mission. Regarding the first few days on Eastern Island, he wrote, perfect runways for such a place as small as it is. Birds on this island prevent the quietness. On the day of the mission, he wrote, went into action at 6 a.m. Our ship downed four planes and had to crash land coming in. Had a few close calls, close shots. What a sensation sitting there trying to shoot each other down. The day after the battle, he wrote, we got our aircraft carrier. The engine plate that you see here was pried from one of the two Pratt & Whitney R2800 engines that Dunn helped maintain and powered Captain Collins' aircraft at the Battle of Midway. He kept it as a souvenir after the crash landing. This concludes our presentation of artifacts and souvenirs from the Battle of Midway. And now we will go back to the studio for some relevant questions and answers. I hope you all enjoyed that deeper dive into some of our artifacts that we have here on site here in Fredericksburg, Texas. And now I would like to welcome our guest speaker here, Craig Simons. He's going to be talking a little bit more deeper artifacts that Chris was going into. Welcome, Craig. Thank you, Jacqueline. Yeah, thank you, Chris, for sharing those items with us. You know. One of the great things a museum can do is make the past more tangible to the present generation by allowing people to see physical evidence of great historic events. And doing that makes history less theoretical, less of a storybook, more real, more tangible. In my brief remarks here, I'm gonna focus on the first three items that Chris showed us. And I'll start with Earl Gallagher's flight jacket and Dick Best's helmet. I think it's exactly right that these two artifacts should be paired together. Earl Gallagher commanded VS-6, the so-called scouting squadron from the carrier Enterprise, and Best commanded VB-6, the bombing squadron from the same ship. And both of those squadrons were under the overall command of Wade McCluskey, who interestingly enough was himself a fighter pilot and not a bomber pilot, but whose seniority gave him overall command of the combined air group on that historic June 4th. That will play a role later on, as we'll see. The squadrons of both Gallagher and Bess were composed of dauntless dive bombers. The only difference between the two squadrons was that Gallagher's 17 planes carried 
500-pound bombs and bests carried 1,000-pound bombs. One consequence of that was that best planes with the heavier load burned up gas more quickly. And by the time the planes arrived at the coordinates where the Americans expected to find the Japanese carriers, best planes had already burned up more than half of their fuel load. Well, we all know the story. The two squadrons arrived at those coordinates and they found nothing nothing but empty ocean. We know too that McCluskey spotted a Japanese destroyer hurrying north, surmised the location of the enemy carriers from her course and pursued that course to find the target. But when the air group did arrive over that target, there was more confusion between the two squadrons under his command, that is between Gallagher and Best and their commands. First of all, remember, they could no longer see one another. Chris mentioned the problem with the oxygen masks in Best's group. Here's what happened. En route to the target, one of Best's pilots came up alongside and signaled to him visually that his mask was not working. Unwilling to break up the squadron, Best took off his own mask pulling it over that helmet we just saw, and waved it at his wingman. The message was clear, if unspoken, we will all go without masks. Then he led his planes down to 15,000 feet, where the air is still pretty thin, but breathable without a mask. That allowed him to keep his squadron together, but it also took him beyond visual range of both McCluskey and Earl Gallagher. So when, after projecting a northward course, thanks to that Japanese destroyer, the dive bombers found the Japanese carriers, the Kido Butai, the two American squadrons, Gallagher's and Best's, could not see one another. One is at 20,000 feet, one is at 15,000 feet. Remember, they had maintained radio silence up to this point, but now having found the enemy, that's no longer necessary. So McCluskey got on the radio and ordered Gallagher, wearing that flight jacket, to take the carriers on the left and ordering Best, wearing that helmet, to take the carrier on the right. Here's the problem. Best never heard that radio message. Very likely the reason is that Best was sending McCluskey a message at the same time. Best radioed to McCluskey that he was going to take the near carrier and that Gallagher should take the far carrier. That actually is consistent with Navy doctrine, which was that the scouting squadron, Gallagher's, with the lighter bomb load should bypass the near target so that Best's bombers with the heavier load could take the near target. But remember, McCluskey was a fighter pilot by training, less familiar with bombing protocols. So as a result of this misunderstanding, all 32 Dauntless dive bombers of the Enterprise Air Group prepared to dive on the same ship, the Kaga. Now, unaware of that, Best assembled his squadron into attack formation. The pilots adjusted the prop pitch, cracked open the hatch of the cockpits to reduce the likelihood of the windscreen fogging up during the almost vertical dive. They opened their flaps, were just about to tip over into the dive when suddenly the bombers of Gallagher's squadron, 5,000 feet above them, all came screaming down past them, right in front of them, toward the Kaga. Best had to think fast. If all 32 planes attacked the same carrier, the other Japanese carriers would be entirely unmolested. Best quickly closed his flaps, signaled to his squadron to hold up, stop. Too late. 
already committed to the dive. 14 of his 17 planes all joined Earl Gallagher's planes to attack the Kaga. Only Best's two wingmen stayed with him. That meant that while 27 American bombers attacked the Kaga, only three remained behind to target the Japanese flagship, which was the Akagi, a few miles away. Now, the attack on the Kaga was spectacularly successful. The first three dive bombers missed, but the fourth, flown by Earl Gallagher himself, wearing that flight jacket we just saw, landed a 500-pound bomb squarely on the flight deck of the big flat top. The bomb had a delay fuse, so it pierced through the flight deck and exploded in the crew's berthing spaces, starting a fire. It was the first of several fires that would eventually burn out of control until La Caga had to be abandoned. Gallagher's hit was followed by others, including several by planes from Best's squadron carrying those 1,000-pound bombs. We know that at least one 1,000-pound bomb exploded on the packed hangar deck of the Kaga, crowded with fully fueled planes armed with torpedoes. Very quickly, it became evident that the Kaga was doomed. But what about the Akagi? Best led his two wingmen, both of whom were ensigns and who deserve to be mentioned here, Ed Kroger and Frederick Weber, toward the Akagi. Now, ordinarily, these three planes would have been met by a swarm of Japanese Zeros flying CAP, Combat Air Patrol. Not this time. And why not? Well, most of you know the story. Only minutes before the commander of Torpedo Squadron 8 from the Hornet, John Waldron, had defied orders from his boss, Commander Stanhope Ring, and abandoned the Hornet Air Group to fly his own course to the Japanese carriers. As he did so, Ring and the rest of the Hornet Air Group flew off to the west and kind of out of the battle in what has come to be known as the flight to nowhere. As a result of that misadventure, Waldron's 15 torpedo planes were all alone when they found the Kido Butai. Waldron attacked anyway, completely unsupported, and the Japanese Zeros swarmed down from their covering positions to annihilate all 15 of his planes. All the pilots, all the air crew were killed all save one. And that one, famously, was Ensign George Gay, whose goggles Chris just showed us. And by the way, after Gay's plane was splashed and he found himself alone in the water, surrounded by ships of the Japanese fleet, Gay whipped off those goggles, though obviously he held on to them. He took them off because he feared that sunlight flashing off the lenses would attract the attention of the Zero still flying around him overhead. The annihilation of Torpedo Squadron 8 was obviously a tragedy of the First Order, and yet, as most of us know, their sacrifice was not in vain. For the low-level attack by the torpedo planes brought the Zeros down to 150, 200 feet, thus clearing the skies at 15,000 feet, which allowed Best and Kroger and Weber to approach the Akagi entirely unmolested. Best led the dive almost straight down and released his bomb at 1,500 feet. He turned to look as he pulled out and saw that his bomb had landed square in the middle of the Akagi's flight deck. As on the Kaga, the Akagi's hangar deck was crowded with big Kate torpedo bombers, all of them with fuel tanks filled with aviation gasoline and armed with big Type 91 torpedoes. Other ordnance lay on carts nearby and on racks stacked along the bulkhead. Best's one bomb started fires that cooked off most of that ordnance. 
And once the explosion started, the aviation fuel from the wrecked airplanes fed the spreading fires. The bombs of Kruger and Weber each landed close alongside the Akagi, doing significant underwater damage, but it was Best's 1,000-pound bomb that was the kill shot. In the end, the three planes under Dick Best did as much damage to the Akagi as the 27 planes that struck the Kaga. Within five minutes, two of Japan's biggest and best carriers were on fire and would eventually sink later that afternoon. Earl Gallagher's flight jacket, Dick Best's helmet, George Gay's goggles, each a memento of one of the most decisive moments in the history of the United States Navy. These physical icons allow us to better understand the circumstances and of course the men who were responsible for this astonishing victory. Thank you, Craig, so much for that talk. I really, I felt like I really learned a lot um, from that. So thank you again. Um, so we're now going to be opening the audience. So our first one is going to be, uh, he's asking, do you have, do any ships oh. survive as museums today? Any of the ships that were, that fought at Midway, do yes. they survive as museum ships today? Well, the, the short answer to that is no. Um, there is, of course, the Yorktown at Patriots Point in Charleston, but that's not the Yorktown that participated in the Battle of Midway. This often confuses people. When the Yorktown CV-5 was sunk after the Battle of Midway later the next day, uh, a carrier that was under construction at the time, which was scheduled to be named the Bonhomme Richard after John Paul Jones's ship in the American Revolution, its name was changed to Yorktown to honor the one that had just been sunk and its whole number was 10, CV-10. So there were two Yorktowns, CV-5, CV-10, that both fought in the Pacific War. This not only confuses students of the war, it confused the Japanese at the time. You know, you can almost see them saying, hey, I thought we sunk that thing once, maybe twice, here it is back again. Uh, but no, the, the ships that, uh, that participated in the Battle of Midway uh, were no longer exist for visitors, sadly. Uh, next one is from uh, Congressman Pete Olson. They're pursuing the decimated Japanese fleet with TF-16, the USS Enterprise and the Hornet after Midway. They were undamaged. Four of the six Japanese carriers that attacked were sunk at Midway. Um, we had two fleet carriers, and did he ever think about going after them after the battle? Yeah, again, the short answer to that is no, but of course, there's always a long answer that follows, and that is there are people who are going to second guess the decisions made by the commanders. Frank Jack Fletcher, is often forgotten, was the overall American commander at Midway, the senior officer president afloat, the SOPA. But his ship, the Yorktown, was crippled and damaged, and therefore he turned over operational control to Ray Spruance, whom a lot of people think was in charge of the battle from the start. But he was from this moment on. And Ray Spruance had a consideration to make, and that is to pursue the Japanese fleet. He knew three of them were sunk. He initially thought it was going to be four, but then he knew that a fourth was still out there somewhere. He knew it had been damaged in the afternoon strike, but there was never a confirmation that it had been sunk. So he could go after it. And there, of course, were the cruisers that had accompanied the carriers as well. So there were useful targets out there. Why not pursue them? But he remembered what Admiral Nimitz had told him prior to the battle, and that is that these are the last operational carriers we have in the Pacific Ocean. Do not take undue risks with them. If you think there is any risk involved, don't take it. And so Spruance turned the carriers around and headed east away from the Japanese during the night, in part to make sure none of those Japanese surface warships uh, was able to make an Enron or come up on them in the night. The Japanese famously were very excellent at night fighting. Now, there have been critics about this. 
Uh, but I think, and subsequent uh, investigation demonstrates that this is exactly the right choice. Because one of the things the Americans did not know was that Admiral Yamamoto Isaroko was himself at sea in the Japanese super battleship Yamato, several hundred miles behind the Kido Bitai, and he was steaming east as fast as he could go. It is not entirely impossible that had Spruance decided to pursue the Japanese through the night hours, the sun might have come up and found him within gun range of those 18.1 inch guns, and that could have thrown away all that had been gained in the air battle. So it was a conservative choice, but it was consistent with the orders that Nimitz had given him. And it says a lot about Spruance's nerves of steel that after he gave the order to turn around and head east, he went to bed and slept like a baby. Um, here's one from James Early. He's asking, what are your thoughts, because Chris also mentioned this, about the accuracy of the 2019 Midway movie? Ah, uh, the new Midway movie. I, I had low expectations and therefore was pleasantly surprised. There are things you can pick apart. I mean, silly little things like the Japanese tied an anchor to the feet of the American POW after they got the information out of him and threw him over the side. They wouldn't have wasted an anchor on him. Anchors cost money. They did in fact throw him over the side, hit him with a fire ax first and then dumped him in the sea. So they were cruel enough, but, but those are tiny, minor and unnecessary. The overall picture of the battle, I think was pretty good. And I wasn't sure what to make of Woody Harrelson as Nimitz. Once again, I was skeptical going in, but you know, not too bad. I was kind of impressed. So overall, I'd say, you know, B plus, A minus. This is from David. He's asking, what was the role of submarines in the battle? Yeah, that's a great question, actually, because uh, Chester Nimitz, as you may know, was an old submarine hand. He, he, gotten his uh, ensign's bars wet as a commander of the, the Plunger, an early 100-ton uh, submarine. He had been on the staff of the submarine commander in World War I. So, and in fact, he had built, he had supervised the construction of the submarine base at Pearl Harbor, uh, which he was using as a headquarters at the time. So he was very much concerned with the performance of the submarines, and he put them out in places where he thought they were positioned to ambush the Japanese as they approached. That did not happen. One big disappointment was that one of the submarines, the Tambor, actually got within sight of a, a significant Japanese surface force, turned in a garbled report, and then immediately dove without making sure the report was acknowledged and understood, without conducting an attack on the surface ship. So he Nimitz was very disappointed with that. And that, that commander, by the way, was subsequently relieved of command. The important role, and it was one Nimitz did not foresee, was the one played by the Nautilus, an oversized American submarine that attacked, the only one to make a, a, an attack on the Japanese main battle force, on a Japanese carrier, that attack was unsuccessful and he was immediately forced to dive by Japanese destroyers who then kept him down by just relentlessly attacking him with depth charges, which is why that uh, destroyer, uh, the Japanese destroyer was still there in the location where the Kido Butai had been when McCluskey arrived and spotted it and intuited, fighter pilot though he was, that this was a laggard from the main fleet. He extrapolated its course northward and it brought him eventually to the Japanese main battle fleet. So you could argue that the Nautilus, the American submarine Nautilus, played a role, not one it had imagined in the battle, but Nimitz was disappointed that none of them managed to uh, launch a torpedo that contacted uh, a Japanese warship. And he was quite disappointed in that. Uh, this is from Patrick. Had the Japanese totally decimated Midway Island, would that have changed the course of the sea battle? Uh, no. Again, no. I keep saying no to these questions, don't I? I don't think so. Remember that Midway was ostensibly the target of the Japanese offensive. But in fact, Midway was bait. 
the uh, Yamamoto picked on Midway as a target because he suspected it was important enough and close enough to Hawaii to make the Americans sortie with their aircraft carriers. The real target of the Japanese was those carriers. So yes, they bombed the island and, and shot up the runway and burned down the hangars and hurt the hospital and a number of other things. But the destruction of the island itself, of the atoll, was a sideshow. The whole objective of this operation is to get the American carriers. And because of the code breakers, those carriers were hundreds of miles north of Midway in quite literally the last place the Japanese would look for them. And that enabled the Americans to spring a surprise on the Japanese. So the real battle, what mattered in this confrontation was the confrontation between the Japanese carriers, the Kido Butai, and the three American carriers that Nimitz had pre-positioned at Point Luck. What happened on Midway was uh, tragic for those who were killed there. I'm not meaning to downplay that. It was obviously important to John Ford, who was on the island making movies, but in, in terms of the strategic impact of the battle, Midway was not the target, it was the bait. Our next question is from Glenn. What lessons learned at Midway changed tactics later in the war? Lessons learned at Midway. The biggest one is that the uh, devastator, the ineptly named devastator torpedo bomber had passed its prime, long past its prime. Uh, we didn't really figure out that the torpedoes didn't work for some time yet. That was a discovery that would be made in 1943 and resolved late in 1943. But the fact that the Devastator torpedo bombers were too old, too slow, uh, not able to defend themselves, uh, that became more than evident at the Battle of Midway. Now, of course, the solution was already at hand. The new Avenger uh, a torpedo bomber was just coming on the line. In fact, there were four, I think, Avengers who took part in the attack on the Kido Butai from Midway Island, although they attacked unsupported and therefore did no damage. But the Avengers, the next generation of torpedo planes coming online, that was something that needed to be fixed, and it was. Um, that's probably the single most important uh, lesson learned from the battle. And of course, the, the overwhelming significance of being able to maintain and keep secret the fact that the American code breakers were reading enough of the Japanese secret messages to give them an advantage of where and when and in what strength the Japanese were likely to make a move. That, that was critical too. Evan, did any of the Japanese destroyers at Midway participate in Operation Tengo three years later? I could not tell you. What a great question. Um, I guess you'd have to get the order of battle. I'm sure that Samuel Elliott Morrison has that, not in the one volume book, The Two Ocean War, but in the smaller uh, books. He tends to have the order of battle for each operation. And you do have to be careful because as with the Yorktown, there are some ships that shared a name, the Laffey comes to mind, the, La the destroyer Laffey. Well, was it both in the Solomon Islands and at Okinawa? No, there was a Laffey at both, but they were different ships. But I think the only way to find that out is to go to the order of battle uh, in Morrison, find the two lists and compare them, and then check probably online to make sure that it's the same ship and not another ship named in honor of the first one. So it's a little complicated, but I think you can track it down. Uh, another question from Congressman Pete Olson. How did the April 19th, uh, April 18th, 1942 Doolittle Raid on mainland Japan impact Admiral Yamamoto's urgency to engage our carriers? Yeah, a lot of times it's assumed that the Japanese decided to attack Midway and draw out the American carriers and sink them because they were horrified that American bombers had hit Japanese cities, thereby potentially putting the emperor's life in danger. And that was so unacceptable that it was necessary to sink those American carriers. And therefore, they set up the Battle of Midway. That's not quite true. Uh, because Yamamoto, we now know from Japanese records, 
uh, Yamamoto had decided to attack Midway and draw out those carriers and sink them well before the Doolittle raid took place. Now, the way it did impact what happened at Midway was this way. And that is that although the Imperial Japanese Navy had already committed itself to the Midway operation, the Japanese army refused to cooperate. It's hard for American audiences to figure out the Japanese army and the Japanese Navy are, are technically on the same side, but they are not partners. They are rivals. They are competitors. They competitors for resources and support and for the emperor's goodwill. And they really don't much like each other. There are several cases of Japanese Navy officers trying to assassinate army officers and army officers trying to assassinate Navy officers. It's not like the army Navy football game here. It's really bitter and intense. So the army had said, we want no part of this dumb operation. We've got other fish to fry. But when the Doolittle bombs fell on a half dozen Japanese cities, the army said, oops, uh, now maybe we will participate too. So the army provided its support uh, for the landing force and some other elements of the occupation forces that would be on Midway. So in that respect, the Doolittle raid impacted the fine detail planning of the Midway operation, but the operation itself had been online and on track well before the Doolittle bombers arrived over Japan. I think we have time for just a couple more questions. Um, so this is by Anthony. Uh, would you agree that the relationship and confidence by Fletcher of his intelligence officer at Coral Sea, that the earlier battle, Coral Sea, would have been the turning point that Midway was? Oh, well, you know, historians love what if questions because we can say anything we want and who would know otherwise. Um, it, an interesting speculation. Um, Fletcher was more dubious of what the code breakers could tell him that was operationally applicable. Uh, there was a guy named Tex Baird who was on board the Lexington in the Coral Sea, and he made certain suggestions and I guess Fletcher decided that he did not like those suggestions and decided to do something else. Well, that led Tex Baird to criticize Fletcher within the intelligence community and that tendency to think, well, Fletcher, he just doesn't believe us. He doesn't trust us. That legacy bled over into subsequent operations. Um, so if Fletcher had listened more to what the intelligence people said, would he have stayed then in the Coral Sea, continued the battle afterward? It's possible. I think, though, that once the Lexington has that secondary explosion, you know, it survived the initial Japanese attack. And then there was an internal explosion that was the one that was really the death knell for the Lexington. And once it went down, uh, uh, Fletcher is left with a crippled Yorktown with a hole in its flight deck and a sunken Lexington. The idea of carrying on the battle, I think, is probably off the board. So, uh, you know, is it possible that he might have stayed? We know now the Japanese had decided to withdraw. Um, maybe he could have inflicted more punishment. Admiral King sent a message saying, why didn't you send your destroyers to conduct a night torpedo attack? And in fact, after the fact, it becomes pretty clear that would not have worked out either. Destroyers couldn't have got there and back before daylight, which would make them exposed to Japanese attacks and so on. So um, yeah, hindsight suggests that maybe more could have been done uh, if Fletcher trusted the intel more. But remember the idea of relying on intel for tactical decision-making is brand new in this war. Um, so the fact that, that Fletcher kind of kept his own counsel and opted to withdraw southward instead of continuing the fight kind of makes sense to me. And it made sense to Nimitz at the time, who wrote him up, recommended him for the Distinguished uh, 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 Cross and, uh, and a promotion uh, for his conduct of the battle. We have time for one more question. There's a lot in here, so I apologize if we're not able to get to your question today. Um, we did try to do our best. Uh, Jacqueline, there's there's a question there about the uh, B-26s. Oh, okay. Let's, let's do was, that. Oh, further, further up. up? Okay. Let's talk about that one then. 
I can tell Chris wants to talk about the B-26s. So yeah, I know. Good. Okay, it's by David. So did either of the torpedoes dropped by the B-26s score a hit? Oh, this is such a sad story. Uh, you know it, Chris? No. I, Chris, do you want to take this? Well, the diary indicated that yes, but I believe the answer is really no. Yeah, that is correct. In fact, if you look at the diaries and memoirs and letters home and even stories that they told to their hometown newspapers, uh, if all of them were accurate, we sunk about 100 ships at Midway. Um, because if you fly out there and then you launch your torpedo or you drop your bomb, the B-17s in particular from 20,000 feet were dropping bombs in the ocean and they exploded when they hit the surface. And the pilots all said, look at that, we hit that aircraft carrier. What we know now is that none of the planes, not the B-17s, not the Vindicators, not the B-26s, not any, not the new Avengers, nothing that was launched from Midway, 90 some airplanes, ever hit a thing. The only damage was, I think Lieutenant Murray strafed the Akagi after he launched his torpedo and came so close to the superstructure that we know now that Nagumo on the bridge wing actually ducked, thinking that that plane was gonna hit him. Um, those machine gun bullets peppered the superstructure. That's the only damage done to the Kido Butai in the entire battle. All of the damage was done by the carrier-based dive bombers from the Enterprise and the Yorktown. And of course, it drove the Navy pilots nuts when they would go into the officers club afterward. And the Army pilot said, we sank four carriers. And the Navy guys would say, you didn't sink a damn thing. And then fists would fly. In fact, there were headlines back in the States, Army bombers sink Jap fleet. Well, you can imagine what the Navy pilots thought of that. We know now that despite their hope, their belief that they had done damage, to the Japanese carriers, none of those bombs, none of those torpedoes did any damage to the Japanese whatsoever. Thank you to everyone. Thank you, Craig, for sharing your expertise on the Battle of Midway. Thank you, Chris, uh, for going a little bit deeper into what we have in our collection. Uh, we really hope that you'll be able to uh, get the chance to come out and visit us here in Fredericksburg. Uh, we would really love for you to join us at some point. So thank you again for joining us this afternoon. A recording of this will be posted to YouTube and Facebook. So if you missed a little bit of it, don't worry, you'll be able to go back to it. So thank you again, Craig. Thank you everyone for joining us. Have a great afternoon.